Hello and welcome back to the Herbal Entrepreneur Conference. I am Yolanda Joy and in this session we are going to be talking about one of the core fundamental topics of the Herbal Entrepreneur Conference which is the kinds of business models that you can follow as an herbalist. Whether you're a practitioner or a maker, what, whatever type of herbal business that you want to create, there are different forms of business models that you can incorporate and really make your dream come alive. For this session, I am so thrilled to be able to introduce Tad Hargrave from Marketing for Hippies. Tad, I'm so glad you can join us today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here as always. It is. I always learn so much from you because you have a wealth of experience, not only from like personally working in business, but with so many other um, entrepreneurs and business owners in like the the hippie space, I guess, <laughs> which I think a lot of herbalists do fall under this umbrella. And you really do have great insight into the business side of how we can like market our businesses but also the models behind how we can actually run our businesses as well. So with that in mind, would you like to give a quick introduction to yourself and what you do over at Marketing for Hippies? Yeah, uh, so I help hippies figure out how to market their stuff better. That's the basic idea. Uh, and I suppose I work particularly with these folks in business who uh, they're doing something on the probably the holistic front, the coaching, the uh, healing front, permaculture, this type of thing. They're usually service providers, but not always. And they feel torn between either have to do marketing in a way that is ethical and makes no money, or it's effective, but I can't sleep at night because it's so unethical. And I think for many, there's a feeling of being torn like you have to choose between the two and so the basis of my work is saying uh you don't have to choose i love that concept i think it is a great philosophy that we don't have to do one or the other but we can do good things while running a business and that is what we're here for really today at this conference it's about learning how we can actually do what we love put like work with herbs while we're doing it in a way that feels good which i know you say um is a core message of yours at Marketing for Hippies as well. Mm -hmm. So when it does come to the topic of business models for herbalists, I know that it is like a fairly broad topic in general, but I think it would help if you started with a bit of an introduction or let us like start to get our minds thinking about what the options are in the different types of business models that we could potentially um, lean towards. So yeah, what do you, what are the options out there? Okay. Well, first, probably good to just name what we're talking about when we talk about business model is we're talking about the structure of the business, the architecture of the business. And so that's number one, because I think in business, people tend to think a lot about the content, but not a lot about the context. They tend to think about all the things that fill in the business, but not the business itself. And uh, so that's one. The second fundamental distinction before we get into any fancy business models is this much larger conversation of do you want to have a business or do you want to have a hobby because if it's going to be a business then we've got to talk about business models if it's a hobby there's much less need to think about structure you know having a hobby is like having a tent that you can just pack up and move on and, and just enjoy wherever you want Having a business means a bit more of a permanent structure, uh, you know, something that is takes a lot of effort and thought and, and design. And there's nothing wrong with having hobbies. You know, we don't have to monetize every square inch of our lives. For some people, herbalism is just going to be this thing that they do for joy and for fun, uh, and they're never going to want it to be a business. But I lift it up because I think uh, I've seen a lot of people kid themselves over the years. You know, they, they're saying they want a business, but they're acting like they want a hobby. And that's a tough middle place to be. So it's good to make a decision one way or the other. Is this going to be a source of income, maybe a significant source, maybe your main source of income? Or is this just something you do on the side, but your spouse can, you know, float the family financially 
or you are rich and you inherited money and you just you don't or your expenses are so low and you've got a job you don't really need to okay so if we're talking about this isn't a hobby no i want this to be a business well then yeah there's a number of different structures and the there's a kind of meta structure of the whole thing and maybe i'll, I'll just share a slide cuz I, I know this is in the webinar um, that I do, but uh, okay, let me just share this one second. So there's four elements that I think are most important, you know, because a lot of people talk about passive income and the tactics that people are given for, you know, we could all probably list a bunch of things, the, the, the false promises we've got around passive income, and there isn't really such a thing. What makes passive income is you build a structure that over time uh, is easier and easier and easier to do. You know, people start off maybe as employees to somebody else, then they become self-employed, but that's still, you're employed. <laughs> you're just the worker, uh, but you're in charge. It's, it's a good deal. Then you might become a business owner. And when you become a business owner, that shift requires a business model because to be a business owner means you need to bring other people in. And if you bring other people into something where there is no structure, that's called drama. Uh, that's, that's a, that is so much work. So you're going to need structures and that means systems and checklists. Yeah. And all of that together over time can equal income. That's sort of passive meaning you, you put the work in up front. So, you know, you live in a home and you're just warm all the time. It's amazing. I can't believe this. I wake up, there's snow outside, and I'm warm. Huh. And it feels passive, but of course, there was an immense amount of effort to get to the point where you have a home and where you got the firewood that you needed and you got the wood stove and the, all of that. Um, no such thing as completely passive, but you can get closer to there. And th these are the four things. You've got to have a business that is safe. Um, and by safe, in this case, I mean, of course, safe for you emotionally to do, but primarily what I mean here is it's safe for the other people to check you out. It's safe for other people to look at you from a distance before having to commit to buying anything. That's got to be a part of the business model. The business model has to achieve that. Uh, it needs to be simple. It's got to be satisfying uh, for you and it's got to be sustainable for you. So, you know, could you keep doing it the way you're doing it forever uh, right now? If so, it's sustainable. Do you enjoy it? Is it bringing a lot of meaning to your life? Okay, well, then it's satisfying. Is a lot of stuff slipping through the cracks every day? Probably not simple. And can people look at you uh, and engage with your business and your material without ever talking to anybody, you know, anonymously? And it, well, if yes, then it's probably pretty safe. So we have to have all four of those lined up. You want at least at least uh, eight out of 10 across the board cumulatively, though some may be stronger or weaker. And then if you can achieve those, you know, whatever the, the particular model is, is less important. Uh, but that's where you can then get creative. The challenge, of course, is if you create a model where uh, only one or two of those things are achieved then no matter how fancy it is and what the title is, it's not going to work. Um, and then, of course, at another sort of meta level, maybe let's do another. So this was from a book. Uh, it's not av available anymore. Pink Spoon Marketing by Andrea J. Lee. And this is the very simple idea that most business models, and again, you can do this in multiple ways, have this sort of a structure to it. Uh, the free stuff, there's free stuff at the top. There's something cheap. Those are a little more expensive, the more expensive than the most expensive, you know, bronze, silver, gold, etc. It's wider at the top because there's just more people who are going to be interested in your free stuff. It's narrower at the bottom because less people will be interested in, in throwing down most of the money. The important thing about understanding that structure is it's the whole thing together that works because it's very tempting to say, wait, $500. I'd rather just make $500 at a time. Thank you very much. So I'm only going to have that part of the business model. But if that's all you do, you don't have a broad enough funnel at the top to have enough people to even be interested. Like, where do you find the people for the $500? Uh, 
it's from this. So the cumulative consequence of having all these levels thought out, now it might be five, it might be four, it might be three, it might be two, I don't, you know, as long as it works, it works. But there has to be a way that people can find out about you, learn about you, get a taste of what you do before they spend the big money. So I would say that's the overall structure we're talking about. And it's something worth doing is to sit down and look at something like this and just draw it out. And what do I have in my business that's at each of these levels? Because this is where people start to see where their business model is falling apart. So for example, how much free stuff do you have? Uh, how much cheap stuff do you have? Do you have anything cheap? Or do they have to go from free to something that's pretty expensive? How much? And do you have a premium higher end whole enchilada kind of level? And often, no. So whatever's missing, that's the thing to focus on. Um, so that's, that's sort of big picture. But I'm curious what questions that brings up for you. Yeah, well, I'm interested here in the examples of this. Okay. So perhaps we could take like two different examples examples like a herbal product maker and someone who is a practicing herbalist for example um and looking at what sort of things they could potentially have as those entry-level products and what sort of things would be more like down the line and also how like you bring someone from that top level to that bottom level or whichever way it goes so like yeah if you can think about those two examples and how that would work that would be helpful i think okay let me there's a few ways we'll do that here um so, you know, for free stuff, for pink spoons, it's all these, these four types of things. You can have written free things, you can have video, you can have audio, or you can have quizzes and assessments. You know, so that's a little more specific and we'll get into even more specific in a second, but generally we're talking about that. That's the type of thing that you can have uh, at the pink spoons level. And then um, if we're talking, talking about uh, things that are lower uh, in the funnel, as it were. Uh, here's some brief examples of the types of things this can be. So, you know, you can create basically packages, programs, or products and services. So you can have bundled products, right, on a particular theme, situation, or issue, uh, or bundled services put together. Uh, you can have programs, workshops, and retreats, and you can have products or services. So. Um, you know, if you're an herbalist and you sell products, well, you might, there might be services that you could add in there. There might be things you could add as a service, because let's say the product they're buying is for um, digestion, digestive issues. Well, maybe you could also offer a service that's a consultation on, you know, digestive stuff as a, as a bonus if they would like it. Or if you offer services, hey, I help people with our digestion as an herbalist, you could also sell products, you know, either way. If you're teaching yoga, you could also sell yoga mats. And if you sell yoga mats, you might also, you know, host yoga classes from time to time. Um, so generally there's that. But let's talk um, some specific examples. So. If somebody is a um, an herbalist and they're, the way they're working is as a service, they're a medical herbalist or something like this. One, well, one of the very first questions before we even get to business model is, you know, what's the niche? Who are they trying to reach? Who are they trying to help? Because often it's we're just trying to help everybody with everything. But let's say uh, we'll stick with the digestion example. So, you know, they help people with, you know, sore tummies and bad digestion. Then here's the business. There's a few things. There's a number of pieces you could include in a business model. I'll give the uh, model I'd probably most recommend, but then I'll show another image which has a number of options. The thing I would most recommend is uh, I don't I haven't put much out on this. I've got one video recently you could find on YouTube about, about this idea of a starter kit. And I think having a starter kit is a great idea. So on my website, if you go to my website, you'll see that I've got this uh, ethical marketing starter kit. And that starter kit is the full footage of my day long marketing for hippies 101 workshop, plus a number of curated materials so that people get a very clear 30,000 foot view uh, of my 
of my work is a you know it's a very generous pink spoon uh it will people will absolutely have a taste of what i do so if i were that herbalist i might have a starter kit that could be a number of things it could be a uh, yeah a video of a of a lecture or a workshop or a series of videos of hey if you're struggling with digestion and particularly this digestive issue here's what's going on here's my diagnosis this is my prognosis of where this goes if you handle it or if you don't here's my prescription generally um, and here's a number of things you can do aside from herbs you know i'd be giving them some some basic stuff that they could be doing uh, and a really clear understanding of look here's the herbs that you know are most helpful for this or here's the class of herbs and here's basically what they do in the body here's why they work i'd be making the case for that and then uh it's you know and hey if you want some personal hand holding and help around what dosages and uh you know really dialing that into your life and and having some hand holding of when to change up the herbs and all this, you can come to me. And what you're doing is building an enormous amount of credibility. And then when people want help, you're the one they're likely to come to because you're the one that helped them already. And they trust your point of view, they trust your philosophy. So having a starter kit that could have a workbook. So for example, you might give them a workbook that's like a food journal and just, hey, for the next week, you know, track your stuff. And one way to think about this is what's the work that you wish your clients would have already done before they came to see you the first time? That could be part of the starter kit, you know? So, you know, you could have them do their own food journal and then you say, uh, it, at the end, there's a video saying, okay, I want you to look through it and how many of these types of foods are in there? You know, what patterns do you notice? What time did you eat your first thing? What time did you eat your last thing? Uh, what symptoms occurred when? And if they track that, you know, you could give them a little video uh, generic assessment. And then you say, okay, but if you want more help, bring this to a first session with me. And then they're already ready. They're gonna be a better client. They'll be a more ideal client because they've already done that work. So I love that idea of a starter kit because it's free for people. They can check you out from a distance. They're getting some value and it's, you know, relevant to them in particular. Um, so that's the kind of thing that would just sit on your website and Hey, if you join my email list, you'll get this starter kit. But in terms of reaching new people, because that's kind of passive in a way that you could also do Facebook ads for this starter kit. That's one model you can do, which I've been doing and it's been growing my email list uh, very, very nicely. The other thing that you can do is a signature workshop. And this is something a colleague of mine, Bradley Morris talks about. And you can just, if you just Google or on YouTube, Bradley Morris um, signature workshop, you'll find some videos on it. But it's this idea of uh, if it's online, a one hour workshop, if it's live in person, you could maybe do two or three. Um, but let's just imagine it's online. You do a one hour workshop where you give them, here's my philosophy on this issue. And there's four things that go into this signature workshop. The very first thing is your story, just why should they trust you? Why should they listen to anything you have to say? What have you gone through in your life that makes you uh, relevant to them? Yeah, that's uh, the brief, but it's there. Number two is you're gonna share your philosophy, your point of view. So again, your, your kind of diagnosis, prognosis, prescription on that issue, you're gonna share any of your kind of maps, charts, the very high level stuff. So like I did with the four circles uh, and then here's the sales funnel. That's that's very high level. We could get much more nitty gritty on each of those parts, but that kind of image is what I'm talking about. And then number three, you want to give them a, a, Bradley calls it a kind of breakthrough experience. You want to give them a, some experience where they say, oh my God. Now this could be a question you ask, a little exercise you give. It might be uh, one of those things that whenever you say it to clients, they say, oh my God, that's amazing. That makes so much sense. The kind of mind bomb stuff, the, the stuff that when they leave, it, they're going to have a hard time forgetting that particular piece. Uh, so you want to give them some experience. It doesn't have to be big uh, and take a long time, but it's got to be something viscerally um, that will resonate with them. And number four, then you just got to just tell them what else you have to offer. And so then for the business model, that could be for an herbalist, you might have a 30 day program. 
you might have uh, a, a day long workshop or maybe a, a two day retreat or something, you know, there's some next step. You say, hey, if what resonate, if this resonated here, here's the next thing you can do. Uh, it could be a home study course that they buy. That's the next step. But there's something else after. So it's not just thanks for listening. Go to my website and find out later. It's here's here's a bigger thing you can check out. Uh, and then you just have to figure out what that bigger offering is, which may you know depend on uh, a number of factors. And we can go over some more examples. But as a uh, service provider. I just cannot recommend enough. Have a starter kit that's available, uh, or at least some free stuff. But I think the starter kit is nice because what happens otherwise is we get, oh, I got some articles, I got these YouTube videos, I got some reels on Instagram. But the starter kit is sort of, it pulls it all together. It's this is the 101 real basic. The signature workshop will have a lot of that same material, but this is not recorded usually. This is live. This is a uh, you're going to somebody else's audience. So you say, oh, I work with digestive issues as an herbalist. Well, I know somebody who does meditation, you know, and a lot of digestive issues can be stress and they work with stress. So maybe they can host me to their people. That'd be great. Or, um, you know, I, I uh, ah, there's this coach, he works on nonviolent communication. That's a lot about, you know, dealing with uh, stress. And, oh, and this one does trauma work and somatic experiencing. And this one's a yoga teacher. You see what if you could find people where there's enough overlap and kinship that your work might be very useful to their audience and they're not going to offer it on their own to their audience. And you get them to bring you in to speak to their people, because if you develop the signature workshop, you'll be able to do it once for your people. You get a, a really nice response twice. Uh, there's there's noticeably less response. Third time, nobody shows up because everybody who wanted uh, it, you know, the well is now dry. You've gotten all the water from your well. It's gonna to have to take time to refill. So if you wanna reach new people, you've gotta be hosted and brought into other communities. If you're an herbalist working on reproductive issues, maybe it's some women's group, a red tent group, and you, you, know, you can go in, or people who teach the fertility awareness method, or uh, a acupuncturist that focuses on fertility, all those types of hubs. Uh, <clears throat> And then you have something else to offer, and that can then go in a lot of directions. But the idea of a starter kit, a signature workshop, those two, I would just recommend across the board to any service provider. And beyond that, there's many, many more options. We're talking about the other example was just making products. You're making medicines and such. Exactly. So like creams or oils or teas or something like that. So like, yeah, someone who makes their own edible products and wants to get them out there. What would be that, like an example of the different levels of um, uh, products in the model? Yeah, well, it's interesting because the, the, I suppose, first of all, there's a, do you want to do direct consumer? Or do you want to do wholesale? There's that question of what mix is it going to be? Because some, you know, herbalists will say, you know what, I just want to go to the local organic food store and they sell all my stuff, the local holistic shop, and they just sell it all. That's my one place. Great. Or there's multiple local stores or all these stores in this area are going to you know, sell it and you travel around and you, you do that, but it's not direct consumer. You could also do it farmers markets. You could do the you know holistic trade shows that happen from time to time. Uh, where you're selling directly to the consumer. So I'd say that's one question is which of those appeals to you structurally better? Which one do you feel uh, more excited about? And then I would really strongly recommend that there are, well, you know, it's also who do you want to be selling to? Because let's say somebody is, yeah, they're a holistic practitioner, they're a medical herbalist, they're an acupuncturist or something, and they want to give. Uh, medicine, but they don't want to make it. You know, I'm sure there's lots of people who they go through the herbalism courses and they think, man, I think herb herbs are amazing, but I don't want to make the medicines. I just want to give them out. So maybe you could be the supplier to the practitioners. You know, that's a whole other way you could go about it. But um, and it, the, what had me think about that is if you're giving it to the practitioners, they may just want the specific herb. 
But if I'm Joe Public, what I want probably is a some sort of a blend, some sort like okay, for example, um, I've got here this is a local person, so kidney clear. So this is a combination of some stuff supportive to the kidneys. There's parasite purge, right? This is so easy for me to understand as a consumer. We've got liver TLC, and then we got uh, well herbal bitters. That's a little less issue specific, yeah. But parasite purge, kidney clear, liver TLC, I know what that means. You know, so if I've gone to a practitioner and they say, yeah, you should take some herbs for your kidneys, I said, great. And then I go there and I, which happened, you know, I went to the, the shop and I said, do you have anything for kidneys? And they said, yeah, this stuff. Great. Problem solved. So that's going to make it much easier. Then, of course, you'll notice there are different sized bottles of these things. So some people may just want the smaller bottle just to try it out. And some people are going to want the bigger, the bigger bottle. Uh, you know, some people may want an even bigger bottle. So that's another uh, level of offerings that we could be having. You could also create a subscription model where it's like, hey, if you're going to be working on this issue for a year, you know, I can mail you this or you can you can pick it up every month, you know, and you're just paying in advance, locked in for payments around these uh, these particular herbs. And still, business model wise, there's this question of how do you get it in front of people? You know, where can you be sharing these? How can you be sharing these? And even then, I would say a workshop is a helpful thing. You know, something people can come to where you can just educate them about this. Uh, now, if you're educating, if you if you want to do a kind of, hey, Herbalism 101 for holistic practitioners workshops, because you're wanting to sell to the holistic practitioners, then you might just do an evening of, here's the amazing stories about herbs and what they can do that you may have never heard. And here's what different, you know, herbs are. And, and then if it was to the public, you might have a workshop on, you know, let's say uh, cancer and, and herbs. And you say, look, there's an amazing amount of research around using uh, herbs to help treat cancer, or at least as a support in cancer treatment. And this is gonna be an evening where you're gonna learn a lot about that. And then people are going to that and you could be brought in. So, you know, you could, you could have a, a very niche herb business where it's, we, everything we sell is about kidneys because there's an epidemic of adrenal fatigue. So we have a number of products about this, you know, and then you're doing workshops, educating people about the kidneys and what is a kidney and what are the herbs and how does this work? Here's the research. Here's some stories and examples of what's happened. Here's the, the mechanism of how these medicines actually work in the body. Here's what's going on that we understand. And so, you know, this is why, you know, trade shows can work very well. Uh, for some people or the farmers markets but the, the, the herbalists that are going to do the best are not the ones who are sitting there desperately hoping they're the ones that are engaging conversations with people educating people as they go let me pause there because there, there's more i could say but that's that's some initial thoughts yeah i can definitely see how there are just like so many different examples then really getting into the nuances of it like you can really talk about this for a long time because there are lots of men, like lots of different examples and ways that you can go about this because if it's not always the same and it does depend on your niche like who your target audience is and these things that you've been talking about it is important for each person listening today to do a bit of reflection as well on like who it is you're serving what it is you want to achieve and start to like um, get ideas in that way I think it would be useful now as well to strip it back a little bit I know yeah. that a lot of people listening are in that beginning phase of working out what to do in their business or um, uh, yeah, really how to get things started. And for these people, they might be feeling overwhelmed as well about all of the different product types and like where to get started. If um, there is someone in that phase of like getting started, where do you think is the most important place for them to um, focus on initially? In terms of business model, hands down, the place that you start is what's the lifestyle that you want to have. And everything gets built around that. That's the most important thing. How do I want to spend my days? Because 
if you think you know the thing I would love most is just to be out in nature most of the time harvesting the medicines working in my garden oh my god that's my dream okay you got to build your business model so that it allows you to do that if you say no 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 I want to be with clients oh my god I just love the conversations and what comes up it's so rich I, so you build your business model to facilitate that and you might think no 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 I really want to be teaching people I want to be educating people Okay, you know, so whatever it is, or maybe it's no, I want to be in my lab making these products. Uh, I want to be in the apothecary and just, you know, all right. But that's the most important thing to start with. How do you want to spend your time? Because if you don't get that clear, you can build a business model that takes you away from that. The classic example is, you know, uh, Mary bakes cakes and everyone says, Mary, you bake the best cakes in the world. You should start a bakery because that's what you love to do. And now you can make money doing what you love. Mary's never had that thought. Oh my God, you're right. I love doing this. I'm really good at it. People really love my cakes. I've won some awards for my cakes. I'm gonna start a bakery. So Mary starts a bakery and within months, she's not baking anymore. Why? Because she's hiring, she's firing, she's doing the books, she's doing the marketing, she's setting up the shop, cleaning up the shop, buying ingredients. No, and she's not doing the things she actually loved to do. So. It's important to be clear and whatever the business model is, you do that. Now, when we're growing, we've got to really focus on the fundamentals because we can get lost in the bells and whistles. We can get lost in the shiny objects that happen. And I think there are these five fundamentals. Now for your people, the ethics probably handled. Yeah, we don't need to worry so much about the, the ethics. In the mainstream business world, uh, th I would have to spend 90% of my time talking about that. Um, Okay, but this is connected to lifestyle, but the question of niche, what do you want to be known for? What do you want a reputation about? Who do you want to help? You know, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? Where, when, why? Those deeper questions, uh, you spend 10 minutes on that, it'll save you 100 minutes. Yeah, you spend a dollar on that, it's going to make you $10 getting clear on your niche is important. Now, in the early days, you, you may just have to experiment with a lot of things, which is also a business model issue because people don't realize how much experimentation there often is in the early days. So they leave their job and they just start, you know, the herbal business, but without enough savings. And so there's no bandwidth to experiment. It kind of has to work immediately. And that's too much pressure to put on the, on the whole beast. So, uh, but it's just a question that we have to grapple with. Uh, and the opposite of niche is uh, just be everything to everybody, which a lot of people do. Oh, well, some of my clients want this, so I do it, but then other clients want this. Well, and then I don't, well, and I don't want to be hemmed in, so I'm also doing this. And suddenly you're doing everything that any herbalist has ever done in the history of the world, and you're trying to do them all uh, so that, that you, you burn yourself up. Then there's point of view. What's your philosophy? What's your approach as it relates to your niche? Um, you know, if people don't buy the concept, they're not going to buy the course. If they don't buy the, the perspective, they're not buying your program or your product. So really articulating, how do you see the world? How do you see this issue that you help people with? How do you see herbs? Um, and, you know, what are the stories that you could tell about that? This is so often what builds the connection between us and them and the credibility. Then of course, business model that we're talking about now. And then last is hubs of, well, okay, now where do you find your people? So in the early days, we sort of generally, we start at the bottom of this pyramid and we work our way up. Um, so as you can see, before we get to business model, niche really has to be grappled with. It's important to have point of view, uh, you know, at least very strongly considered the beginnings of it, that, that seed planted before we get to business model. Um, and the other thing I would say is uh, in the early days, look at a lot of different examples and models. It's, you know, if you're thinking about getting into herbalism, look at like a hundred different herbal businesses. Just look at their basic structure. What do you like? What don't you like? What lights you up? What, oh God, no. You probably, there's some businesses you might see and you just are immediately exhausted. You think, no, I, I couldn't do that. You don't have to. There's all sorts of ways to do it. So look at a lot of examples in the early days. Uh, I think people 
really well and truly don't do this, or they leave it way too late. Uh, the looking at other examples, you know, it's 10 years down the road and they think, oh, I should look at some other examples so in the early days. Look at a bunch. And then the other thing I would say is in the early days, get help. Get help, uh, professional help on this. It, it's just going to save you so much time. If it's a hobby, no need, you know, just enjoy the making the medicines or doing what you do. But if it's a business, you know, you've got people like Yolanda out there who herself, I mean, I've seen a lot of hippie businesses, but Yolanda's seen a lot of herbal businesses. So get help from somebody. Um, and this could be whether it's products or books or coaching or programs, get some support. So you're not trying to do it on your own. Because in the early days, we're, we're, um, we're just new, we don't know much. And then there's a lot of expensive mistakes that we make, because we're so new, that we just don't have to make. Uh, you know, not required. It's common, uh, but it's not. Um, it's not needed. It's it's normal, but it's not necessarily natural that that should be the way it goes. Uh, those are my initial thoughts. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective. I think for those people who are newer to almost take a step back from the business model as well, because there are those pieces, those building blocks that come in underneath the the business model that we do need to think about first. We need that ethical basis, first of all, sustainable um, herbs and yeah, just the um, like everything in that ethical um, building block first. And then it comes into the niche, really what you do, your unique perspective, how you help those specific people and the point of view, because you have your way of doing it. And like that, all of these things before you can, like really dive into the business model, you need to have clarity on those things in the past as well. For people who are interested in um, learning more about that as well, we do have like, Tad has spoken at the Herbal Entrepreneur Conference in previous years on those topics. So specifically on your niche and on point of view marketing, we've covered in previous conferences as well. So you can check that out or again, go to marketingforhippies.com um, because yeah, Tad has a lot of content and a lot of it is free and inside the starter pack as well. So if you're really wanting to go deeper, it's a, um, it's a good place to start. The other um, side of things that I wanted to cover as well is yeah. for the more advanced herbalist. So for someone who has got things going, like I'm interested in how the business model evolves over time as well. So like how um, things can change when people would like maybe understand that they need to change something and how they go about doing that. So maybe, yeah, you have some examples of how people have done that or like things to watch out for as people go through that growth phase in expanding their business model as well? Yeah, okay, great question. There are a couple thoughts there. One is we gotta go back to this. Uh, at various points, you just gotta stop and evaluate and look at where you're strong and where you're weak. And this is the simplest exercise, but this one, is, this pays the rent, is you give yourself a one through 10 on each of those circles. You know, is your business safe for people to check out or is it risky? One through 10. You could also look at it is, does this feel safe for me to do or is it risky? Is this sustainable or am I burning out? Is this simple or am I feeling overwhelmed? Is it satisfying or feeling meaningless? Just give yourself a one through 10 on each of those and you'll start to see immediately what needs to be changed because th I mean, this is happening for me too. For example, I would give myself a fucking 11 out of 10 on safety, yeah? Um, in terms of satisfying, oh man, it's very high, it's nine or 10. In terms of simple and sustainable, I, I've been really realizing, oh no, <laughs> I, I've got lower scores here. So this is my work right now in my own business is, is this, because I can feel the burnout and I can feel the overwhelm uh, and so can the rest of my the contractors who I'm hiring or working with. So that's number one, you know, give yourself a little bit of a check-in from time to time. How, how am I doing? What's, what's strong? What's weak? Well, you can do this with the funnel too, right? Every once in a while, you just step back and look at it. It's like, wait, is, how's that going? Am I missing something? Because sometimes we drop pieces out as we go, and suddenly there's a huge gap, and it's too big for people to make the leap. 
uh, or things need to be refreshed. But also there's this piece from um, Linda Claire Pui here. I love this. You can do the evaluation of how much high touch stuff and low touch stuff do you have and how much one on one work do you offer and how much one to many. Because sometimes what will happen is people they've got all this high touch one on one stuff, for example. And these three are empty. They don't have anything here or they've got a lot of you know group stuff that's very low touch, but there's all of this opportunity here in these three quadrants. So often I find people are very strong in one of these quadrants, but they're missing a lot of the others. So this can give you a, a sense of you know, what to shift, what to reevaluate. Also, if you're more advanced, almost certainly one of the things that you're missing in your business is uh, our, our systems. And as we grow, it's, we just, you know, we often just sort of trip and stumble into a business we just, oh God, I don't know how it happened, but now I'm in an herbal business, you know, and we just don't have the, uh, the inner and the outer systems that we need because we were just building on the fly. We weren't really uh, thinking it through as we went. And so, for example, let's share this here. For example, when we're looking at systems here, here's, you know, you need the inner systems in your business. Like if you're going to be hiring people, do you have systems? Do you have a checklist for that? A process you go through? For the, the DWMQA, we call it the DUMQA. But this, this is huge. Oh my God. If you're in business for a while, you need this desperately, and you almost certainly don't have it, is a list of the things you do daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually. Number one, that you make the list of all those things. Number two, you figure out how much time each of those actions take. Number three, cumulatively, how much time. So if you have two hours of stuff to do every day, is that actually in your calendar right now? Because if it's not, it means it's gonna be taken up by other things, which means you're not doing the maintenance on your business, which means you know that will catch up with you. And same with the weekly stuff. So you gotta have your, your calendar actually represent the reality of your business. And every once in a while, you have to stop and just reflect and go over those lists. Do they need to be updated? Do they need to be refreshed? You know, just recently, I realized I had, I didn't have time in my schedule just to answer emails. And I saw, I'll put in an hour every day. And I realized, oh no, it's three hours. It is, that is three hours every day. But once I put that in as a recurring thing in my schedule, oh, then when people say, hey, Ted, you want to do this thing? I look at my schedule, I say, nope, <laughs> I'm busy. I got... I'm already full. And that is, is saving me so much drama and saving other people so much disappointment, you know, when I when I have to bail. Um, but do you have systems for follow up systems for customer service systems for bookkeeping and accounting for cancellations and no shows? Do you have policies, in other words, around that? Because if you don't, that is a leak in the bucket, you know, do you have systems for managing your tasks? Do you have a like to do list manager? or for staying in touch with your people. See what I'm saying? If you're, when you get to a certain level, you need all those systems. And then the outer systems, do you actually have a sales funnel thought out? Do you have any premium offers? Do you have any packages? Do you have any little beta tests or pilot programs that you could be doing to try things? Do you have an intro workshop slash signature workshop? Do you have ways of reducing risk for people of taking the first step? Uh, what about pricing? Have you thought that through? Or, or systems for launching things? Or systems for ongoing marketing do you have? So when you get to a certain stage in business, I think you've got to look at a list like this and just say, okay, what am I missing? Because if you're missing these systems, eventually one of those four S's, you get a breakdown. Yeah. <clears throat> Suddenly it says, well, yeah, the business is really satisfying, but it's not uh, sustainable. Or it's sustainable, but it's no longer satisfying. So it's good to have a check in and this itself can be a system, you know, this can be one of these oh annually, what do I need to do, I need to go on a two day retreat. and just shut down the business for two days. Go to a cabin and just think about my business and how's it feeling. And what's working and what's not another way you can look at this is I call this the attractions quadrants I don't think I have the image here but the basic idea is. There's stuff in your business that is attractive for you and there's stuff that's attractive for them. 
And there's stuff that's unattractive for you and your business and stuff that's unattractive for them. And, and that makes a kind of quadrant, um, which I'm just looking to, oh, I do have it. Uh, and this exercise, it, it's, it's, all, it's too simple. You know, and I, I know when I share it with people, um, I can tell they're not impressed. But when I have people do this, I see the, when they actually take the time to do it, the eyes open wide. Right, so every once in a while you gotta sit down and just say, okay, so what's attractive to me? What do I love about my business? What's great about it for me? And then what is not attractive to me? And for my people, what do they love about my business and what don't they love? And if you're, if you're just willing to make those charts, what that means is this, stuff that is unattractive to you, that you hate, you've got to deal with this. You've got to change that. You cannot allow that to continue because that again, that's the leak in the bucket and you will all, that'll kill your business. And stuff that's unattractive to your clients, that's easy, low hanging fruit. Just stop doing that, you know, if you can. Um, and the things that are attractive to your clients, yeah, emphasize that more. Make it even better. Stuff that's attractive to you, double down on that. Just doing those things. If you're willing to go through those four S's, look at the structure, look at the one-to-one, one-to-many, you know, high touch, low touch, quadrant, this attraction quadrant, if you did that once a year alone, you just know what's working and what's not working. Uh, and you'd be able to figure it out. And then the thing I would say also is this. So let's say you do all those exercises and you realize at the end, okay, I know where I'm stuck, but this is the problem, you're stuck. It's like, okay, I know that's not working, but I don't actually know what to do about it to fix it. No problem. Then you have to do the critical thing that most entrepreneurs don't want to do, which is you got to ask for help. You have to get help on it. Don't try to struggle on your own with something that you're just unqualified for. And so this is where you, it could be a friend or a colleague that you just call and say, hey, can we go for coffee and talk about this? Um, uh, or it could be somebody like Yolanda, you know, where you say, hey, so you have a program that helps with this. I just desperately need some support. You may just need community too. You know, you, whatever it is, figure out what you need and start asking for it. Because the thing I've seen kill more businesses than just about anything is this rugged individualism taken to its extremes. This pride, um, this arrogance of like, no, I don't need help. I can do it on my own. And it's not that the individual choices based on that kill the business. But cumulatively, this creates so much friction and wear and tear that that's what kills the business. There's a breaking point where it falls apart and you can't point to any, where did it fall apart? Because of years of neglect, years of just, you know, taking on way too much work uh, and, and working in a way where the gears were grinding. No, there's some great points there. and I think it makes um, a lot of sense there. And there are a lot of things people can... Um, really just take on those warnings or concepts as well to bring the all those threads together into what they want to want to create over the long term i think that um definitely is very valid there um the to wrap up today's session, I would love it if you could kind of um, give a bit of a summary of the three most important things that you would like people to take away from today's session. So what are the three most important things that um, is important for people to remember when it comes to building a business model that thrives? Number one, do you want a business model? Is this a hobby or is this a business? That is the most important consideration. And just be honest with yourself about it. Because if it's a hobby, just enjoy it as a hobby. Stop pressuring yourself, just have fun. But if it's a business, if you're building a log cabin, build a log cabin. Number two, get very honest and check in on how your business is feeling. So I've given a lot of charts or examples of things you could, metrics you could use. But at the end of the day, this comes down to how does this feel? You know, how is this working? And just to schedule some regular times to have a gut check. And if it's not working, don't make it personal about you. It's just, this is a system. It's a structure. You're not to blame. The system isn't working. 
but check in from time to time. Is this working? And if it's not, instead of beating yourself up, just, okay, what do I need to change about the structure and the, the system in my business that would make this work better? Look at it, look at your business structurally, not as a evidence of your, your, your greatness or your, your smallness. It's just a system that's working or it's not working that feels good or doesn't feel good. So check in regularly on this. Um, and number three, get help. That help might come in the form of friends, colleagues, and community. It might come in the form of just looking at enough examples instead of trying to just imagine this in your head and make up a business model. And it might come from the support of hiring a coach, signing up for a program, but get help. Do not try to do this alone. Those would be my three. Yeah, I think they're great tips. I really just like making that internal decision initially to be serious about this. This is a business and it's okay to choose to do a hobby, like you said, but if you're going to do it, this business like do it as a business when you do the the middle ground that's when things get blurry when you start like burning out and your hobby doesn't become fun anymore so like really just choosing if you're going to do a business like you are going to do a business and then like that second step of really checking in and like keeping the pulse on the business so that you can redirect and decide where you're going to go. Like that's super important because as an entrepreneur, I think anyone who has been on this path for a little while knows that things change. And even like you as an entrepreneur change as well, what you want changes, what your audience wants changes. And so keeping an eye on um, what is working and what's not working, that's really the way to redirect that. And the, the, your final point about like getting help it is so important I think most people listening today who are starting businesses now didn't have entrepreneurial parents or like mentors in that way and are learning a lot of the things themselves now and like from a mindset level but practical level accounting taxes like there is a lot and without help it is incredibly overwhelming so it's like a really um important tips there so yeah thank you for sharing that i think that's a great overview and pretty important steps for people um who are on this journey yeah thank you and thank you for your work and what you're doing you know this field of herbalism working with plants coming to plants as medicine is uh, more and more needed every year. I see the insanity, all the changes in natural health regulations, how they're making it harder and harder. I was just in England and talking with a fellow on the street, passing out these newspapers you know, about what's happening. Uh, and it's so important. Um, and there's, so, there's just so little support. I mean, there's more than there was, thank goodness. But I'm just, I'm really glad you're out there. Uh, Please know whenever I meet herbalists, you, I send them to you. I'm like, oh, you go check out Yolanda when they're struggling with their business. And so she can she can help. She's got lots of thoughts. She's seen lots of examples of this. So uh, I'm really glad that you're out there. Yeah, well, you, I, I really do feel passionate about connecting other herbalists from all over the world and helping each other because, yeah, we're not going to be able to get the word out there and like make a real difference in the world unless we do learn the skills to communicate what we do and be able to like actually reach the people who need our products and services and yeah the way we can do that is by sharing like what we're doing today and really just being able to pass on those lessons and experiences from one to the other we all become stronger and that's yeah that's really what it's about so yeah Thank you so much for sharing. If people want to know more about you, perhaps they want to get your starter kit or that we also have an extended version of the um, business models uh, workshop, which will be available um, for people listening today. So you can click through to check that out. But um, yeah, if people want to find out more about you and Marketing for Hippies, where can they go to find out more? Just marketingforhippies.com and all the info and social media, all the links are there. Wonderful. We will have the links on this page as well. So everyone can click through and sign off and see what's available there. But uh, yeah, once again, thank you so much for being here today, Tad. It's always a pleasure learning from your experience and getting ideas about how, how we can run businesses that feel good and get the word out about what we're doing too. So thank you once again. You're welcome. Thank you. Take care.